To lead our next panel, I am pleased to introduce the National Forum's chair, Warren A. Jones. Dr. Jones is a past president of the American Academy of Family Physicians. He is a retired captain in the U.S. Navy Medical Corps. He was appointed by Mississippi's governor to serve as director of the State Division of Medicaid. He founded the Mississippi Institute for Improvement of Geographic Minority Health and Health Disparities, and he broke a glass ceiling as Associate Vice Chancellor for Multicultural Affairs at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Additionally, he held the NIH Endowed Chair in Health Disparities Research at Dillard University, his undergraduate alma mater. I think you will agree that Dr. Jones is well-suited to lead a panel on connecting health equity to more Americans' priorities. Dr. Jones? Well, thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining our panel, too. Um, our topic is connecting health equity to more America's priorities. It's a, it's a, a critical time to talk about that. And we're very fortunate today to have a panel of experts that will share their insights and experience with us. Uh, first joining us will be uh, Mayor Christina Mern, uh, who's from Finley, Ohio. Uh, Mayor Mern is a Finley native and is a, the third of four daughters uh, of, the, uh, of uh, Michael and Terry, Michael Terry and Laura Miller Wasson. So um, Mayor Mern graduated this is embarrassing to me, but she graduated summa cum laude <laughs> from the University of Finley. I graduated most merciful laude, so you know I'm thankful for that. Uh, and she has gone on to really distinguish herself from being a student leader to a trustee to being effective in her community. Um, she's gone on to become the mayor of Mern and is a member of the YMCA there, board of directors. And she come, she's really innovative in the kinds of programming that she would like to see done for her citizens, particularly being active, being physically healthy, and being able to make a difference. So, Mayor, thank you for walking the walk and talking the talk. Thank you. Also joining us today is uh, Mayor Rod Craig, who's the mayor of Hanover Park, Illinois. Uh, he was first elected in 2007 as a, a village president. He has worked to streamline municipal operations and increase transparency. He's worked very hard to make sure that there was cooperation among village government, schools, parks, and other aspects of the community. His philosophy has been to bring together people to address problems and modernize the village's technology. Uh, he brings... Uh, sponsoring a program called Kids at Hope uh, Health Resources, uh, and has been a collaborative in the Ann Fox Elementary School. He and his family have resided at Hanover Park since 1974, when I was only three years old. <laughs> and following his six-year active duty in the United States Navy, he, uh, he's really enjoyed his commitment to his community. Sir, we thank you for being here, and we look forward to hearing what you have to share. Our next panelist is Mr. Joshua Harris, who's a senior management, uh, senior manager of communications with Voices for Healthy Kids. Uh, Joshua is the is a longtime advocate uh, for equitable, systemic, and community change. He has uh, been more for more than a decade, uh, gaining experience in government relations and communications, with a specialty in crisis communications. Boy, do we need you now! Uh, working with organizations in civil rights and empowering people to make a difference in their lives. Joshua is an alumnus of Augsburg University with a BA in communications, focusing on journalism and marketing. He's also um, studied at the University of Oslo in Norway, and his motto is to be informed. To be, his goal is to be an informed global citizen. I salute you for that. We thank you for being here with us today. And our, last final, and our last panelist to introduce today is Dr. Francesca Weeks. She's the executive director of the Genevieve uh, Strategies Group. Um, she is the founder and executive director of that group, focusing on racial equity, policy, research, and implementing policies that impact communities of color. She has been a community health researcher 
a health policy practitioner for over 10 years, so she must have started at age 10. Her <laughs> research includes areas that examine the intersection of racism, health, and in civil rights and law, health reform, and looking at racial bias in community development. As a researcher in training, uh, she's been a policy advocate and has done a lot of work with the NAACP on advocating for equitable community uh, equitable communities with community health policies addressing systematic and systemic racism and health disparities. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. For, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us today. Um, this is a wonderful time and we look forward. To kick us off, as the COVID-19 pandemic shed bright lights on health disparities that were hidden in the shadows of many communities, and George Floyd's murder raised passions about racial justice. Many of us may have thought, hmm, now is the moment to advance health equity. But that moment quickly gave way to arguments over how to reopen society after COVID and concerns about crime, economy, uh, changes to democracy, and access to women's health and maternal health situations. Health equity, though, remains at the top of our minds for many of us in the healthcare and in public health. But unfortunately, it's way down the list for many of the Americans' priorities that we deal with on a regular basis, if it's on their list at all. Uh, this panel is going to address framing specific words, concepts, and messages that will help to resonate well with individuals. So, to aid us today, we've developed three thorough but broad topic questions that can help to frame our discussions. Um, so panel, put on your seatbelts and here we go. <laughs> Mayor Marin, we'll start with you. Um, how can we help more Americans to see that their big concerns can be addressed through programs and policies that improve health equity? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is education and instilling hope in people. Um, you know, we talk about education and COVID was a prime example of folks not knowing where to get accurate information, misinformation being shared, um, not understanding how um, in times of, you know, health issues or medical issues that as, you know, as leaders, as public health professionals, as physicians, we have to pause and, it, and give more background and understanding to help bring people into a position of knowledge to then make their decisions. And, and I think when, as a leader, as the mayor, um, we have to educate and kind of meet people where they are to then help them make informed decisions for themselves, um, while also then working as community leaders to put in those policies and procedures at those very basic levels to help move us a little bit forward each day. Thank you for that. Great way to kick us off. Great way to kick us off. Um, Mayor Craig, uh, you know, it's been talked about in some communities, health equity is not a big issue for us, but a lot of times they don't recognize the cost that health inequity brings to every community and to the state and to the national government. For instance, I don't know how many people we would talk to would recognize that health inequity has had a cost of $1.24 trillion annually in the United States. From your perspective as a leader of a community that's always looking to get better and stronger, how would you share your insights about the big concerns and programs and policies that can improve health equity? Well, pleased to do that. Um, as, a, as a leader of, uh, of our community, 40,000 people, four townships, two counties, you know, we're, it's, a, it's a challenge. And what a mayor can do, and I've evolved over the years, is to model exactly what we expect outcomes to be. And so if I provide a proclamation about the equity of that, you know, I'm very active with our schools. They're, Two mornings a week, I'm in different schools reading to the kids. But it's about ensuring student success. Mm -hmm. And in a community that is very diverse, 
I mean, I have a Muslim community. I have, uh, you name it, uh, black, white, orange, purple. I mean, we cross all these boundaries. And so when you set a standard and you model that standard, my board is as diverse as the community. And mm -hmm. so that's walking the talk. And so when you do that, uh, many years ago, we had a major setback around uh, the diversity. They say, well, I don't like this guy or I don't like that guy. Well, I'll tell you what. I let them all know that if you come to the mayor for a response, I expect you to meet your neighbor, have a barbecue together. And if something's ailing your neighbor, it's ailing our community. And our community is going to grow and, and develop. And so my activity with the schools evolves into activity with the hospitals. And the hospitals have been marvelous. If I talk about our support for, for um, folks in our community, wherever they come from, there's always a special need. And if we can find a way to, to do that, and my role, uh, uh, people define my role. What is my role? My role <laughs> is to facilitate all good things. So good health, good community relations, excellent policing, a fire department that understands that you can't live with only men in your fire department. That's our history. And so our fire department has many women. In the Muslim community, a, a man can't be touching a woman. So the women in our fire department really help facilitate it. And it creates goodwill. And goodwill in the community helps to develop a, a, a community that is a hometown community. It's a community that enables the success. And I try to model that. I try to emulate that. Uh, it's not always easy, especially in this day and age. And uh, our uh, cross boundaries has uh, it, it, been just marvelous. So uh, in an area, in a, in a state that's really suffering uh, with uh, where we're going, I think we have been, uh, on track um, in Illinois, we're one of the safest communities because of who we are. And we're only 20 miles west of O'Hare. So we're not that far on, you know, we're in the corporate area. And uh, so I, don't, I hope I'm answering the question. But Oh, you've done, you provided us a nicer range of, uh, of information and good insight. And you touched on something, if you don't mind, I'll tease out. You talked on, you touched out, uh, touched on your leadership and being able to adapt it to the needs of your communities. Um, uh, I remember reading a book by a gentleman who was a, a physician leader, and it was written right after 9-11, and it was called The Way All Boats. And it was a gentleman named Mike McGee from Pfizer, and they, they served as a place to bring people in. And when I asked him his thought on leadership, he said the key thing about leadership is leaders lead. And what I've heard from you and Mayor Marin is that's what you do. Layers, leaders lead. You step forward to do that kind of thing. And, and we need that. But we also need information because researchers do a lot for us. Uh, they generate new knowledge. They validate existing knowledge. And then they help us to disseminate knowledge once generated. Dr. Weeks, from your background, how would you answer our question today about the kinds of programs and policies that might be most effective across America, regardless of size of communities in improving health equity? Right. Um, I think one of the key things we definitely learned and saw during COVID is that we have to listen to our communities. Um, I know in the description, you mentioned that a lot of these disparities and equities have been hidden. And the truth is, if we had listened to people decades ago, centuries ago, we would learn it's not hidden. It's in the data. It's in the qualitative research we can do. There's plenty of qualitative research in the community saying these are issues. And they will tell us how to address the problems needed for their community. So it's not that we haven't known. They've just been underinvested. And neglected. And so the way we start addressing these programs and policies is first, let's start going back and listening to people. There's a lot of people in the community still struggling from COVID, um, from not having jobs, from still having to homeschool, oh. from not having daycare. And some people are still struggling even day to day to feed their families because they are trying to catch up economically. And so right now, even from COVID, we need to go back to our communities, have some conversations. What do we need to do to help right now? 
what policies do we need to put in place? And on top of that, our policies really need to come on the local level. We've seen a lot of state elected officials putting in policies that don't impact the most vulnerable community. So we need to empower our local legislators to have that autonomy, have that authority to be able to make the decisions and not let the state legislators make all the decisions for our local levels. So we have some listening to do. We have some rearranging to do in who's making the policies. And we have a little bit more work to do. I would say a lot more work to do. And the policies needed right now and not 10 years down the road in order to impact health equity. Thank you very much for that insight, Dr. Weeks. And uh, as you say, it's, we've got to learn to effectively identify policies that work because we all know that far too often folks get mired down in politics and not necessarily look at policy. So your point is so well taken. But, you know, uh, Mr. Harris, one of the things that we've got to think about is now that we have information and data, how do we effectively communicate with the members of our community so that everyone feels ownership of the successes and feels the responsibility to be engaged with the challenges? Absolutely, that's a great question. Uh, and I first like to start by saying to Mayor Mer uh, Mayor Mern uh, and Mayor Craig, uh, they have the hard job, right? Because they are focused on how do we build totally well communities. While Francesca and I are in the background figuring out, giving them talk, folks like them talking points and the data and breaking down and disseminating it, they have to be the front facing to deal with the community directly, to deal with the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so I commend you on that. And for uh, Mayor Craig specifically, I am a son of Cook County, Illinois, born and raised in Chicago. So it's a pleasure to sit here with you. Uh, and I'm excited to participate in this panel. Uh, but to go back to your question, I I'd like to backtrack just a little bit. I think it's critical, and as a communicator uh, and someone who's a communication professional, it's extremely important for us to really not only define and determine what messages are and how we communicate them to uh, a constituency, uh, but to understand, right? To understand the impact, to understand the history, to understand what we're talking about. Uh, and so we have to first start by defining what inequity is, right? When we talk about health equity, we have to understand what inequity is. And we're not just talking about disparity. Inequities are specifically avoidable, unjust, preventable, and are often man-made, right? The reason that disparities exist are because of inequities. So essentially, and, and we can look at the data, it, it clearly shows us that the greatest inequities that exist, specifically in, in, in health inequities, are by race. And so we're talking about racial inequity in this case, and how do we create that uh, in many spaces and in, in the health space specifically. And so knowing that, we have to understand that there are systems that have been put in place that have unfortunately allowed for racial inequity to exist, right? And so when we're talking about how racism has impacted systems, uh, these are the ideology and the policies that have been passed over time that have forgotten, neglected, and ignored a certain population of people. Uh, and so if we want to correct that, we have to be focused on not just how to create better health outcomes for all people, but how do we create better health, health outcomes for the least among us, right? We've seen that over time and over the last several decades, we've seen an increase in health outcomes across the board for everyone. But we have not seen change is that gap in between the least among us uh, and those at the top of us. And unfortunately, uh, it is not by income, right? It's not about income disparities. We've seen it. It is clearly the data shows us that it is about a racial gap that exists in inequities. And so we have to focus on a health in all policies. And when we see health outcomes, when we talk about that, we look at education specifically, we can talk about the fact that health matters because if the families and the children in a certain school don't have proper health outcomes, they're not performing well in school, right? And so health impacts so many things across the spectrum. So we have to really focus on that uh, holistically and systems approach on what health and all policies really looks like. And so that means for us getting to the root cause of like, what does it look like to have fairness in our health systems, fairness in our health access, and make sure that every single one of us, regardless of the zip code that you happen to be born into, have the best opportunity to thrive and be successful with your health. Well, wow, that's a lot to chew on, but effectively <laughs> communicated. You know, you mentioned something really important, and that is um, understanding disparities and understanding the relationship between disparities and inequities. For the longest time, people knew about disparities anecdotally until the Institute of Medicine did their study and showed that if you controlled for income and you control for access to care, 
that there still was a delta in the quality of care that certain communities received. And that was the first demonstrated, uh, uh, independently de demonstrable uh, recognition of disparities. So when I give talk about disparities, I'd ask people, is, uh, is diabetes a health disparity? And I'd ask them, is heart disease a health disparity? And they would raise their hands. And I said, guys, none of those are disparities. They are the manifestations of disparities because of the systemic approaches that you just described and that you as Peter described. So I want to go to, uh, to Mayor Craig and ask, um, as elected leaders in rural and suburban communities, how do you establish and sustain interventions that can improve health equities, uh, inequities rather, and how do you gain support from other elected officials? Because sometimes when you talk about inequity, you kind of get looked at a, a little jaundiced eyed. And I was wondering if you would share with us your experience and some of the tools that you utilize to help to bring uh, build consensus and bring support to the issue. Well, this may sound strange, but I use my personality. <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, uh, I come to the table and, and uh, I share this table must represent our community. This table outcomes must represent who we are and what we are. And so in my, I don't know, I've been, what, five elections down the road. And when I bring people to the table, I'm looking for somebody that's in the, in the health care, in the, in the giving, uh, in the outreach. Somebody that really understands some of the systemic racism, the system, the, those things that need to be addressed holistically. And so if I'm, if I'm sitting at the table and I've got a, a model uh, and everybody around the table looks at that model in the center, they have a different view. Yes. I need that diversity. I need that difference in culture. I need all those folks at the table. Now, we're not talking in my community about 100 folks. I'm talking about those who are leaders, who are willing to speak up and represent their community. It, and it, and it, it seems to be working. Now, is that a challenge for me? You bet, you know, because if I start talking about the challenges, well, I might not look like a guy that's supposed to represent challenges. I might, I might look like the guy that's, you know, got it all. Yet in my community, I'm representing every, every, uh, every culture that we have. And yes. it, whether it's the Filipino culture or it's the um, Indian culture, and, and there's like four or five cultures that come from the Indian community, whether they're Pakistani, Muslim, or they're whatever. And so I have those representations on my board. And it's because I do the outreach like I said, I like to facilitate all good things, and somebody from different places can address that, or they have the knowledge and are, and are willing to speak up. And when uh, I don't know, I'm probably losing my 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 focus here, but it's it, to me, it's about the leadership and demonstrating that you're committed to your community, regardless of the culture. And once that all comes together, then you know I see the hospital opening up. Hey, you know, what do you need? The first floor, the second floor in, in some of their outreach buildings. And we're being, bringing folks together. Uh, the systemic component that we've been discussing over the last few years has really brought us to another educational level. Now, some, of, some folks in town, they say, what is this all about? I don't understand it. Well, if they ask me, I'm a part of that conversation and they start to get it. Yes. Which is, which is a good point. As a leader in a community, folks know if you're going to the mayor, the mayor is going to represent everyone, and there's, it's about who we all are as a community. And so I get, uh, I get challenged in different ways like that, but I'm consistent. And, and folks that want to think differently, they say, well, don't call, it to, don't call the mayor because you're going to get this answer. And it's, <laughs> it's about bringing us all together. And, uh, you know, whether uh, I have opportunities to have appoint board members to different uh, relationships and, and um, you know whether it's, it's to the, in the educational front, the legislative front, or the healthcare front. Um, 
I've got I've got a trustee that's just knocking herself out with uh, uh, with her organization, and and it's taking us into a new leadership role, and I'm really pleased with that. Thank so, you. So they call me lead follower, get out of the way, and I'm the. <laughs> 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 they got to all stand up to that, you know. So that's that's where I'm at. I don't know whether to applaud you or run away from you with six terms in office. Yeah, oh my gosh. Yeah, there's two to run away, you know. <laughs> Man, from your position as an elected leader, your thoughts yeah. on how we can bring those bring uh, individuals together. Well, I would completely agree with Mayor Craig that, you know, you have to be a voice for all. And um, as mayor, you're, you're representing the entire community. I would say in looking at how I build and sustain programs to address health equity in, in Finley, I, I'm probably taking a little more of a tactical approach. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I'm a very data-driven individual. And I think that that also resonates really well with our community. Now we have to be patient and I think develop different messages to different people, right? You're gonna reach and impact people differently depending on their background, their their viewpoint, and it goes back to relatability. But we have tried to be very focused um, and obviously COVID kind of sent everything haywire, but brought a lot of things to the forefront. Um, but even before that, we were looking at, okay, what is our community health assessment? What are the biggest areas um, that need improvement and how do we bring uh, what we call the Finley formula re related to economic development, but bring that into our to address our health system within our community and the health inequities that we were seeing. And that the Finley formula is bringing government, business and education and those nonprofits to the table to say, OK, here's the problem and what is each of our responsibilities in this and how do we address it together? And I think many times, you know, healthcare can try to go and do things alone or pioneer this new program or government can start trying to implement policies because they want to address this, um, you know, or businesses may implement programs within their businesses. But if we can all have common goals, you know, the Move with the Mayor program has been a great one. It's such a, a small thing to say, hey, just try to move more. Right. And we can get our businesses on boards with promoting it. We can get our schools on board with hosting events and encouraging kids. And we give out keep active, keep healthy wristbands when I go and do events at the schools. Um, but tying it back to that data and saying, what are our two or three goals that we want to focus on right now to improve the health of all of our citizens? And what are the barriers for them? for us to be able to get to them and them to be able to access the healthcare that they need to make improvements in those areas. Um, so that's how we've been approaching it at this point in time, um, because I think, you know, you, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. I also don't yeah, think that you, can, that you can just approach all of the issues at once, um, at least not from my standpoint, just because, you know, we are a small community, smaller staff. So being able to set out some kind of clear, specific targets that we think are going to make the most improvement has been our approach at this point in time. And I think that long term, that is more sustainable because it's achievable and measurable. It's really great to hear you describe your approach, especially with the Finley formula. Because, you know, many times the uh, mayors are responding to the alligator closest to the boat. <laughs> and so the fact that you have a formula to avoid that situation is, is, is really, really important. Well, uh, that, that goes back to the sustainability, right? When it's not just on government to keep it going and it's not just yes. on health care, when you're all working together and can help you know, support each other in those times when you start maybe waning a little bit. Um, is how you're going to really achieve results, in my opinion. It's amazing how when you, when you allow people to speak openly in a safe environment, how much commonality and collegial, collegiality you find exists in the community, even among people that you thought would be at odds with each other, and how just having someone proactively uh, and forward progressively looking like you two are as elected leaders can bring people together around uh, topics that they didn't even think that they would have agreed on in the outset. That goes Definitely. a long way. But I was thinking also, again, to get back to the data aspect of it, Dr. Weeks, you know, we talk a lot about the social determinants of health, and that plays a role in what we're looking to do with the, uh, affecting the meaningful outcomes. So what kind of advice would you have from your data that would be you'd be able to offer to policymakers 
and designing the kinds of policies that would make an impact in their communities. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think Mr. Harris actually started alluding to it earlier that health is in everything. Um, so for me to say I would just pull up policies just specific on health issues and some different uh, health disparities we see, I couldn't limit it to just that data because it's a domino effect. Our issues around income, our issues around education, our issues around transportation, all that data has to be filtered together. It has to be synchronized together to see that domino effect and how it impacts communities. So a lot of times when we talk about social determinants of health, people often forget that, again, if you don't have access to transportation to get to a medical facility, that's already eliminating you from having any access to seeing what actually your diagnosis is or what even your path is for your health care condition. So I would start out by saying we have to work together. It has to be all the local agencies working together. We can't just pull health um, health department data. Every agency has to sit down and see how our data impacts each other. Um, We know that in certain communities, they have a huge collaborative, what I say, of health issues, but also on top of that, you'll see the transportation issues in the community. You'll see the lack of access to grocery stores in the community. Um, We do a lot of work with GIS, which is really looking at the geographical um, integration systems, and we were able to see where grocery stores are at. We're able to see where pharmacies are at. We're able to see where our doctor's office is at. That's something we've had for over 20 years and we've been using. So again, it's not anything new. It's us taking this data and saying, Where are the communities most impacted? Where do we see this triangulation of all the issues? And how can we bring in resources into those communities? Um, One thing I'd like to also bring up, you guys, we're just talking about, you know, being elected officials. And I'm a big advocate. Like like I said, I have to give you guys a lot of praise because I'm a big advocate for local elected officials because you guys know what's best. And oftentimes I see that on our state level. They'll pass policies to put in different programs that never make it to the local level or they never bring any fiscal money to the local level. And so even as I'm talking about these social determinants of health, if you don't have resources or they're not being allocated for these communities, it's a big conversation that we just keep happening that never anything never gets solved because we have to have people put in policies that will give the resources from federal to state to local or even local. How are we reallocating those resources to the communities that need it the most? So I really think that some of our social determinants of health have to be looked at from a state level so we can get the resources to address it on a local level. As well as I'm really big on preemptive policies where looking at how on the state level we are prohibiting some policies to go in place that would help certain communities. Um, We saw this during COVID where they took up mass mandates or testing sites or they took up different resources from COVID from local areas from being able to put in mass mandates or schools being able to go back in person in order to keep the local officials from making those decisions. So taking that power away locally took away a lot of addressing the social determinants of health needs during COVID. So we have to also make sure that we advocate for local decision making. We have to advocate for people to be able to make local social determinants of health issues and the resources and the finances behind it. So I'm hoping that we finally get that message out that this is a, it really is a top down problem and we need to fix it bottom up and we need the resources to fix it bottom up for our local communities. Thank you very much. If I may add to that as well, um, Dr. Weeks brought up a really good point about the social determinants of health. And I wanna be very clear, social determinants of health um, is what we often used to refer to well, quite frankly, are political determinants of health. There have been policies that have been passed and or not passed that have led to certain outcomes, right? Uh, and so in order to correct the policies that have been passed or not passed, there has to be a in very intentional focus on equity. It doesn't just happen, right? And so Mayor Craig has mentioned it several times. When his community comes to them, he wants them to understand that everyone must be included in the process and a part of the process. Uh, and so that process, and specifically for us at Voices for Healthy Kids, we're very intentional about equity, right? It's not something that we think this is just going to happen or that we wish happens. We have to go out and seek. 
uh, intentionally ways to create equity, right? And that also means economic equity, right? Uh, we can't talk about health equity if we're not talking about economic equity because if we're not pro providing means and opportunity to earn means in the communities that are most impacted, then how do we expect them to have positive health outcomes if you can't afford it, right? And so that includes looking at the consultants that we use, right? We're very intentional about making sure that we have a diverse array of consultants uh, and vendors that we use uh, that come from different communities, different backgrounds to ensure that we're having an injection of funding into those spaces. Uh, but coming back to the policy component of those policy determinants of health, that also has to be very intentional. And we can't be afraid to have uncomfortable conversations, right? Because if we're going to create solutions that are going to positively impact generations, we have to get uncomfortable, right? We've been comfortable long enough that has allowed these inequities to exist uh, for a large sloth of populations um, that should not have to endure. And if you as a, uh, it's it, when we look at it from a health and all policies perspective, if you as a medical doctor have a hundred children from the same community to come to you and they all suffer from burns uh, from the stove, and then you find out that their stoves don't have faces on them and they're all wood burning stoves, you can either continue to just treat the burns or you can say, what in housing policy and housing development do we need to change to ensure that all of these stoves are covered to prevent children from burning themselves, right? And so that's what we look at when we look at health and all policies and health equity uh, and not just saying that, oh, well, they can't afford it, so they don't deserve the best care because the reality is that healthcare should be a right, right? And healthy living and healthy lifestyles should be a right. Uh, and so we have to focus on ensuring that the least of us have those opportunities uh, to really thrive. And that's an intentional focus on health equity. One of the key I'm, things that, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mayor. I was and just gonna I, kind of build on that as well. I think that it's really important to tie um, Mr. Harris and, and Dr. Weeks uh, comments together on the social determinants of health. It is going back to that, having as much flexibility at the local level as possible and trusting our local communities to address it, right? Because my community looks different than Mayor Craig's, than Mayor Ginther's in Columbus, Ohio, or Mayor Lightfoot's in Chicago. And when we, we so often we say, okay, we have this grand idea that at the federal level, we're going to solve this issue and we're going to mandate this and start this program. And we're going to put all these money towards it. But then it really it, that doesn't maybe make sense in my community or it, it actually is stealing resources from another program that was working really well or, you know, um, so being able to have that flexibility to those local communities to focus resources to, you know, personally, I'd like to see more of opportunities for the states or federal governments to say, here are the outcomes we want you to measure and that we want to track towards and here's what your goals are and submit a plan and what you need to achieve that rather than creating this one size fits all programs that are inefficient many times and are probably creating duplicity you know duplication between programs that maybe local communities already have mayor Mern, you just hit it on the head as well many times folks set out to do something and they don't know what success looks like <laughs> And that's the key. We're going to do this, but how will we know we're successful? We're going to gather data. We're going to look at impacts. We're going to do these kinds of things. Um, I, I ran my, the largest state agency in Mississippi. I ran Medicaid. I called that the dark summer of my life. And <laughs> I had uh, 700,000 beneficiaries in the $4 billion budget and never was there a smiling day. So I said, uh, I had my staff of almost 3,000 people shut down every fourth Friday um, and we would walk and it was called Medicaid in Motion. And we would walk around the state capitol or around the areas where our offices were. Do you know that some people reported my agency for inappropriate use of government time? <laughs> not to I'm not to surprised. <laughs> They didn't realize I was saving the state money by having people walk. They were healthier, you know, but it's the kind of thing that we've got to do. And it builds camaraderie, but it takes courage to lead the way that you folks are leading. And not everyone has that. When we look at the National Forum, we're, um, we're an organization of organizations. We have government, we have private entities, we have academics. We have, we have the spectrum. What kinds of lessons can we 
share with our members that they can impact their immediate community and their extended community to have a positive impact on health equity? And how can we, from your perspective, as the uh, National Forum leadership, operationalize it for them to help them achieve those goals? We'll go back to you, Mayor Mern, since you spoke last. We'll get you this time, please. <laughs> you know, I would say in each of our organizations, you know, what is the, the maybe the area that you are seeing the loose, least improvement in? And I would take a step back and determine who the stakeholders are and just listen. Um, you know, and I think then from the national forum standpoint, it would be really interesting to see, okay, if you identified the area that you are struggling the most and three things that after you've done your listening conversations, you think are your action steps to improve that, it'd be interesting to see the commonality on, on what you're hearing from all of those organizations and just sharing that information. Because I think, again, it goes back to each community, each organization. I, I worked in healthcare um, before coming this, and I, I did insurance credentialing and contract management and physician recruiting, a whole lot of things. So that's why I laughed when you said Medicaid, because it, it, <laughs> I worked with multiple state Medicaid organizations, and it was always loads of fun. <laughs> but but when you just sharing information and looking at something from a different way, you know, it's very easy for us to get so wrapped up in just trying to you know, for lack of a better term, survive in, in, the, in, in serving our community and trying to achieve the challenges that we see being faced. And I think we can get overwhelmed and discouraged. And so maybe, you know, identify what that the area you need to improve the most is and look for opportunities just to l listen and learn. And then also try to find some small wins for yourself, things that are going to give you some encouragement um, you know, something like our farmer's market just partnered with the United Way and is now accepting EBT benefits um, mm -hmm. and SNAP benefits for individuals at our farmer's market. So something that it took a while to get it set up, it may be relatively small, but it's one minor improvement to get people access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so finding those small wins that can be kind of morale boosters as well. Thank you very much for that insight. Mayor Craig? Oh, yeah, I'm happy to jump in. <laughs> I have, uh, interesting how our vocabulary evolves and intentional, you know, the use of uh, vocabulary. Um, I used to be called tenacious. <laughs> so, okay, I'm tenacious, I guess intentional. And that goes back a number of years now. Uh, with I have uh, an initiative called the Kids at Hope um, uh, belief system, uh, where all children are capable of success, no exceptions. Okay. That's a belief system. It puts demands on those of us who are engaged to model that belief, all children. So I bring the community together with all the different, uh, schools and they come in and they, they, they see uh, a, a, a opportunities, for whether it's the Civil Air Patrol, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, baseball, football. All these things are out there, and they're all invited. Moms and dads bring their kids to witness this is available to you. It's just not to this neighborhood or that neighborhood or where you, where you come from. So in, in, a, in a sense, the intentional uh, belief that we can all succeed. And in the schools, the challenge for a teacher is quite enormous because who you don't have a choice who comes into your classroom. Right. And so I'm such an advocate for the, for the teaching and the education component around a belief system where all children, now being the mayor, who are your children? Okay. I, I often talk to new mayors. And I tell them, well, did you realize you signed out? You're now the town daddy or you're the town mother? Okay. <laughs> yes. I always Everybody's... tell people I have 42,000 children. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When they come to you, you're fighting for your folks. This is my yeah. town. And, you know, it's kind of a crazy leadership thing. 
But I believe in our community, whether they're the children, the teachers, uh, the moms that are dads who are trying to figure something out, you never know that uh, if you're the mayor, they're liable to knock on your door. Hello. <laughs> yes. <laughs> how come, how come uh, our street's not getting paved? Well, I think the mayor's at the bottom of the list. What do you think? Well, I'd like to get my street paved too. So these are the things that, you know, we discuss and we go through, but it's, it's all intentional. Bringing a community together, uh, that's the success. That's how you drive pride in community. People have a safe community because they want to be a part of having a hometown that is one that they feel safe and, and honored to be a part of. So I always love this word intentional. It kind of popped into our vocabulary the last few years because we do and we must be uh, intentional. And I've been tenacious for a long time about <laughs> setting those standards, but I think it comes, you know, comes from a, a history of uh, trying to help others. It's just my nature. So I don't know. I did, I, imagine, did I kind I of fit imagine. into the flow there? <laughs> Mayor, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine anybody calling you tenacious. No, you're a big teddy bear. How about that? <laughs> yeah, well, that too. You know, I, I'm going to tell a quick story. The COVID thing really killed me because I must get 4,000 hugs a year. Okay, I'm just throwing a number out. And when the COVID hit, nobody's hugging anybody. And, and for me, that was like, geez, you know, I really care for these people, but you know, we're all keeping like this. Yes. And we, you know, we have to, we have to get our arms around one another again and really yes. care. Uh, and I think we're back on that pathway, but we've learned some things along the way. And yes. I'm really excited about those learnings and the growth in our community and uh, keeping it safe. A safe Thank community you. is very important. Thank you very much, Dr. Weeks. Any, uh, your thoughts? Yeah. Lessons um, that, that you could share with our organizational members? Um, I have to start off with a story too. So I wanna say it was probably June of 2020, right when we were really you know, starting to put a lot of different prevention measures out for COVID or really trying to get everybody to still social distance. And I was on a call with probably about 100 different researchers from different academic institutions across the country. And they were asking me about, you know, how do we integrate equity? What do we do? And this is right after George Floyd. So everybody's, you know, looking at me like, what do we do? And I said, I don't know why you're talking to me. I'm not the expert. I said, your community is the expert. And I said, yes, everybody here has degrees. You've gone through this training. You've sat and gone through all these different certifications. But I'm not the person that can tell you what to do for the people who need the resources. I can tell you from data what it says disparities wise they need. But at this moment, are you talking to the people that really need to be touched? Are we really listening to them? So it, a lot of people were like, oh, my gosh, you're telling me I'm not an expert. Not in this moment. You're not. Um, and sometimes we need to take that step back and realize it doesn't matter how many degrees you have, how much training you have. You are not the expert. Those people sitting around you, the people that you need to bring to the table, they are the experts and they are the ones that are going to help you get to the root of the problem and help you solve that issue. So for me, it really is the lessons. Have we really learned anything? Um, I often tell people in school, I was the person to sit in the classroom and I heard nothing the teacher said, but somehow I still went home, studied, came back at eight, got an A on my test. Did I ever apply any of that? Probably not, because I probably just remembered it to put it back on that paper for that test. But my thing is, have we really learned? In this moment, I feel like so many people have just temporarily learned trending words like equity or disparities, and they regurgitate it on certain calls, but they don't know how to apply it. They don't know how to implement it. And so it's important at this time that we really start telling people or showing people, hey, let's do more than just learn it. Let's actually implement it. Let's activate it. Let's put it in action. So there has to be a huge shift that we're going to have to see more than just lessons, more than just learning. It's action and implementation. And I tell people there is no stupid question, which there are some stupid questions, but there really is no stupid question when you're asking me about equity, because I need to understand that you don't understand in order to put you on the right path to help the community. It's okay to ask. It's okay to ask the communities. It's okay to be, quote unquote, an expert with the greens and go into the community and have them telling you stuff. Because some people think that's beneath them and that's not. That's called equity. That's called equality. That's called we are on the same playing field and we are here to help because we 
are both humans and you want to make sure that you get the resources you need. Um, last thing I'll say, you mentioned George Floyd earlier. And it's so interesting that everybody keeps using George Floyd as that momental moment or something that really shifted us in racial justice. We've been fighting for this for centuries. I mean, yes. civil rights, slavery, like we're still fighting for this. You know, there are hundreds and hundreds of George Floyds before George Floyd. And so what really came about is that people started realizing it was on TV. It was big. It's in the media now. The thing is that we need to keep it in the media, not just racial justice, but racial health equity and racial health equity justice. How do we get to that point where we help people see those inequities in communities? Right now, um, you know, we start to talk about Flint, Michigan. We talk about Baltimore. We're having water crisis and no, and the media talked about it for a couple of days and it went quiet. So the inequities are there. They are clear. They're, they're easy for us to be able to go and start addressing it. But if we keep, you know, letting it go to media for two or three days and then we're quiet about it, that stops the conversation. So I know Joshua does a lot of communications and I believe that it's great that we do something when there's a crisis. But how do people help? How do we help people realize the crisis isn't stopping? The inequities are still going. The racial justice yeah. issues are still here. And I know people don't yeah. want to see that in the media every day, but I would rather see that since, than some of the conservative conversations I see in media every day. So yeah. thank, you. thank you. And it's funny you would mention water. Um, you go the next exit up the interstate from where I live, and it's Jackson, Mississippi, and we have a, a Flint, Michigan type of water crisis. So it, it's it's true. Um, Joshua, you get to bring us home. Can't hear you. I was muted. Uh, uh, great. I think that everyone um, touched on some really great points. Uh, and I think it's, I just like to reiterate that one, equity has to be intentional. Two, you have to engage communities. And that sounds easy enough, but I have worked with state health agencies and large institutions and government agencies who have a lot of really smart people who are really degreed, who can put together a great plan and have no idea how to reach the people that they want to serve or who need the resources the most. Right. Uh, and so going back to what Dr. Week says, that means being able to humble yourself and go into a space and say and create a relationship not just a parachute situation where we come in because we need this data and we want to get this done, but actually build a relationship with that community that's long lasting beyond just what it is that you need. Because the reality is they know they pay attention. Right. Uh, and what they do know is that it doesn't matter. Oftentimes in these communities that are most vulnerable, they don't care what you know until they know that you care. Right. And that takes an intentional ongoing relationship to build trustworthiness. Right. Wanting to be trusted does not make you trustworthy, right? And so these are all components that go into like creating equity and it's work that has to be done and it's not always easy work. And kind of one of the last things that I say is that we talked about the health equity or inequities that existed uh, and knowing that that comes back to addressing systems of racism that have impacted our health systems, right? There is actual data that shows us that these inequities manifest themselves in the bodies of people of color through uh, allostatic load uh, or the tipping point for stressors in the body, which create negative health outcomes. So knowing that people of color don't just get to wake up and say, OK, today I'm going to deal with the inequities of the housing system. Tomorrow I'll deal with the inequities of the education system. And then on Friday, I'll deal with the inequities of the health system and I'll separate it that way so that I can do it. They don't get to do that, right? They have to deal with all of these systems every single day. And that's having an impact and a toll on their bodies that creates negative health outcomes, which, as you mentioned earlier, Dr. Jones, has cost us at least one point four trillion dollars. Right. When we look at the disparities that exist in health and equities. Right. So it's costing us dollars and cents uh, in reality and real tangible data. Uh, and so. Being intentional about equity is something that impacts us all one way or another. And so we have to really recognize that. Uh, and it comes back to the conversations that have been had since George Floyd again about what it means to be anti-racist. Right. It's no longer good enough to be like, well, I'm not racist. I'm not doing bad things or I'm not one of the people doing this. What are you doing to correct the bad things that have been done? that other people are dealing with, because that's how we create real systems change. And I've used the term systems quite a bit, but the reality is there's no magical system that exists. These are people who are sitting in seats that are making decisions that are the system, right? There's no magical system that exists. It's people making decisions every day that impact positively or negatively people's lives. And so being intentional about that equity is critical 
if we're going to create a society that works for all of us, regardless of where you're born at, because the reality is we all do better when we all do better. But that means focusing to make sure those of us that haven't done better get the opportunity to thrive and do better. So wow. if I can jump in, because Please. you triggered my funny bone, I guess. The, uh, is it a revolution or is it an evolution? Mm. And I, I believe if, if we're modeling the right stuff, and I've been doing this for more than 10 years now, I'm finding evolution. Over time, people start to get it, okay? It's not about leaving me out, but we have to be, I like to use the word tenacious, but it <laughs> needs to be an evolution. It needs to be uh, consistent. Otherwise, you're not genuine in who you are and what you're presenting. And for me, you know, that, that's what it's about. If somebody comes to me and says, well, you did this, you know, you hung out with these guys because they're all bad. No, no, no. I'm training the bad guys. Okay, what does that mean? Yes. The old guys are car guys, right? I'm an old car guy, okay? <laughs> and they talk to me and say, how do you do that? I said, well, <laughs> it's because we, we all go to the grocery store together. We all want to swim together. I mean, it's, it's an evolution. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I start getting it. And, and in our society, it's hard to be tolerant of as, as we get to know who we are and what we're doing. It's hard to be tolerant. But you have to find a pathway so that the outcomes can come together and we can all sit at the table and respect one another. Yes. And you're, it's and an you're right on. And, it's and, an ongoing learning experience. It's, it's an okay. ongoing evolution. So how do I ever step down from being the mayor of this thing I started? Okay. <laughs> Everybody is afraid. Oh, man. I'm no, afraid. You're, you're, you're having big fun. And that's one of the good things about it. When you find a formula that works, it's amazing yeah. how energizing it is. Even even when you're fatigued, you want to continue. You, you, you probably noticed that in my my character. Um, I am <laughs> highly energized. People yes. give, give me emotion, and uh, the outcomes are, are you got to be consistent, and genuine, and people get that. Well, mm -hmm. that's the that's the that's the navy in us, shipmate, and that's kind of what keeps us going. Um, <laughs> Mayor Mern, we understand that. One of the things that you, one of the innovations you've been able to make occur in, in your community is to have a mobile clinic that can, um, as we said in the military, deliver health to the deck plate or help to get help people to get help in their environment and where they are closer to where they live. Could you share with us your insight in getting that started, some of the challenges you face and what you see as a measure of success? Yeah, certainly. It's been a great program, and I look forward to it continuing to grow. About uh, two or three years ago, uh, my health commissioner for the, both the city and county, we actually have a joint countywide health department, which has been a godsend over the last few years, um, came to us and said, this is something that's been discussed between um, the hospital and the health department. And we recognize, again, going back to those health um outcomes in our community health assessment, we recognize that there is a population that is not accessing the healthcare system for a variety of reasons. And, and some of it being throughout our community, um, just lack of transportation or lack of kind of the intimidation of finding a healthcare provider. And so we worked, uh, the health department was the primary funder, our local Rotary and our hospital both stepped up to also support uh, funding the initial purchase, as well as then the city contributed to it. And uh, it was a politically charged uh, conversation. There was many that felt it was unnecessary, that it was that we didn't have disparity or lack of access, because when you look at our community, it's relatively... Um, condensed. Most people have cars, or at least the majority of people that people are familiar with have cars. And uh, they didn't feel like there was an issue. And we started looking and sharing that data of what do our, what does the health assessment look like? What are our, the number of people using our um, kind of um, low income, easy access clinics? 
on a regular basis. I did a lot of gathering information from um, our local nonprofits on how, how much money they were spending on helping people cover those healthcare bills. We talked a lot about the ER data that we were seeing of people showing up for, you know, lack of control of their diabetes, um, you know, and they're showing up in the ER for that. So it really was communicating why it was beneficial to the public, how it was a resource saver in the long run. Um, and we've been fortunate we got that up and running. We just finally got it fully staffed with an NP that is dedicated to it going throughout the community and they're able to, they were here doing things for my staff like uh, COVID vaccines and boosters and uh, flu vaccines and blood pressure screenings and some of those basic items, but they also go out to the fairs and community festivals and go into the libraries, go to the schools, go to uh, just shut up, set up in the middle of some of our little villages um, throughout yes. the county, um, the senior center, our homeless shelter, um, so they're able to kind of go and meet people where they are and try to decrease those barriers and the intimidation factor of getting access to health care. So it's, it's been a great program, and I see it only continuing to grow and, and better meeting our community's needs as those co needs continue to evolve. And it sounds like one of the most important things you did was to deliver care to people in a way that they retain their dignity. Definitely. It goes progress. back to where, where tr people need to be treated as humans. And yes. Um, it can be really intimidating to get care and ask questions. And, you know, uh, I'm excited that we're able to, to help folks out. Yes. And Mayor Craig, you were, uh, we understand that in your community, um, you were concerned about food insecurity and felt that there were some innovative ways that you could address that for your population. Would you share with us what you yes. were able to do with your I'll team? Be, I'd be happy to. Um, it, it's we initiated, and then there's like 42 communities in the uh, Chicagoland area that really have initiated a social worker in the police department. Mm -hmm. And uh, she has regular meetings with the, with the schools in our community. Uh, all the social workers get together. I said, we've got to do that. And uh, it's, it, it's evolved. And my, it's a part of the my Kids at Hope initiative, this outreach and caring um, where the social worker now facilitates and uh, getting ideas together that to help support uh, the food pantry. And the food pantry does a great job, but with, um, with the police department, we have like a couple months a year, we'll say, catch up on your fines by bringing in five cans of this, or, you know, <laughs> they, they, you start attributing that. Um, and, and it really helps the understanding. If, you know, I might have something here. You know, part of the learning is now don't be bringing in out of date food, okay? <laughs> but, the, uh, but most of us have a few of those cans at home. But the uh, she's really, you know, it takes a special. Our social workers are really special. They have a heart and they understand, and they can listen to those who who really need a uh, resource. Um, and the social worker has, you know, we're blessed having that uh, position. Um, I checked with the chief the other day and, you know, we've had the social worker for uh, quite a number of years. It was uh, something inherent from uh, previous mayors. Um, uh, lady mayor said, you know, we got to do this, you know, and, and I, I swear the ladies really understand that need. Uh, I get it. I understand. <clears throat> so we maintain that we find ways to reach out uh, in a comforting way. So as our, as our needs increase, I think they've been pretty stable because the way we're going, but now we're talking about additional resources to support that because today we understand uh, that need a little bit better than we used to, okay? And say writing somebody off as being weird, well, they just need some, a little support, something that brings them over the hump. And yes. the social worker working with uh, with the police department and our food pantry. Uh, we're blessed in so many ways because it just energizes everybody uh, that we're willing to take that extra step. And every community is a little different and we'd find ways to facilitate good things in our community to help our residents. Like, like I said, you know, when you become mayor, you're all of a sudden the town daddy here and uh, the town mom or 
what, however that is, but you have a lot of ownership for that. You want to see that yes. success grow. And what we learned is it's evolving. It's an evolution, bringing people along. And, and if you're in office long enough, you start to see the cause and effect of that. Yes. You know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, I'm going to let the members of the National Forum know that I'm creating another award, and it's called the Chairman's, I'm Chair of the Board, and it's going to be the Chairman's uh, Big Heart Award because no. you both win it <laughs> this year for what you do for your communities. Um, a lot of people don't understand that communities are live entities, and it takes individuals willing to look beyond the challenges to see the capacities and the capabilities. So as we wind down, we've had a we've touched upon some very, very important topics that our members can use as jumping off points to have significant conversations in their communities of influence, their spheres of influence. But then we also came up with some words that are helpful. One of the words that I picked up on that came out of today was humility slash humanity. And that is being willing to be uh, to look at the humility in yourself to recognize the humanity in others. And I think about the fact that we talked about compassion, understanding whether we use the word or not. We talked about meeting people where they are, helping them to get to where they may need to go. Um, we talked about pride and about having pride in what you do can help you to accomplish what needs to be done. And then we talked about intentionality in terms of being a, a critical component of driving towards solutions that ha make a difference and have an impact. And one of the key things that we've got to make sure really traverse every sphere of communication is the concept of safety. The safety that will allow you to check your fear at the door and go in and be willing to engage in the hard work of making a community for success. Folks, you've been wonderful to talk with today. I've learned a lot. You saw I was taking my notes. Thank you for the opportunity to have shared today with you. And I look forward to communicating with you in the future. Thank it was you. a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.